Welcome to PFF One on One with Solomon Wilcox. Explain the importance of the tight end position. What do you say to that? Welcome to PFF One on One with Solomon Wilcox. Right now, we go one on one with San Francisco 49er assistant head coach John Embry. He's also in charge of the tight ends. Really good group for the 49ers. And John, welcome to the show. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. How are you guys doing? Hey, we're doing great. Now, I should let everyone know that you have coached two Mackey Award winners. That's the trophy they give out in college football for the best tight end um, in college football. And you've also coached at least five Pro Bowl tight ends during your time in the NFL. And now, arguably, the number one tight end mm -hmm. in the league is George Kittle. So I want to just kind of talk to you because I remember Bill Belichick telling me that the tight end position carries a large burden of responsibility in helping the offense to be productive. Explain the importance of the tight end position. Well, you know, we have a lot put on our plate. You know, I, I tell people a lot of times it's, it's like linebacker is on defense and, the, and the, from the standpoint of we're involved in every aspect of the offense. Uh, we have pass protections that we're involved in, and then we have the run game, obviously, and then doing what we need to do as in the uh, run and the pass concepts. So uh, there's a lot on our plate, and um, you know, for me, it's just about trying to simplify the game plan every weekend and give guys some basic rules that they can lean on, so that we can go out there and, and try to have success. Yeah, as I said before, you've helped some young tight ends um, develop the skills that would translate over into the NFL, what would those skill sets be? What skills are most important at the position? Well, the first thing is you, you need to be smart. Um, it, uh, there's so many shades of gray every week uh, with the game plan changing and the, uh, the way they tweak things. And usually it's like, hey, we're going to call it this, but we want the tight end this week to do something different than what they did when it was the same play the week before. So if they're not a smart uh, smart football player, they're really going to struggle, struggle with the different things. And then toughness. Um, you know, I, I like for my guys to have physical and, and mental toughness, and that's something that uh, – um, they have to be able to uh, uh, embrace all the changes and embrace things as it comes down the road as, as we get going um, week to week that, uh, again, like I said, they don't they – don't, uh, we don't get a lot of latitude as far as, hey, let's do this for the tight end or, hey, let's do this for that guy. They just want us to, quote, figure it out and, and get it done for them and then be passionate. You know, we're going to, uh, if you play for me, we're going to do a lot of work. We're going to do extra meetings. Uh, we go out on the field 20 minutes before practice even starts and do our individual and get a lot of work done and teaching. And so if you're not passionate about football, it's going to be hard to uh, to play uh, for me because it's just, you know, there's there's a lot of things that you need to do at this position, and there are no shortcuts, you know. So we're going to go out and do them. Now here at PFF, we use data to evaluate players, particularly coming out of college and coming into the NFL. What uh, data points are really important to you when you're evaluating players coming out? Well, you know, for me, when, when I'm evaluating guys, the first thing with me actually is the film. Um, you know, I, I, I have a saying in the room. We have two sayings. One, no one cares. So don't look to the sideline if you're tired or hurt. No one cares. You got to go. And then two, film doesn't talk. And so what's your body language like when things, something bad happens or something good happens, or are you trying to finish, you know, certain things, are you straining? Those are the kind of things I'm looking for on tape. And then as far as data points, I'm really big on length. You know, I think uh, a guy can be six, three, but if he has nice long arms, I like it because that's going to help him in pass pro. That's going to help him as a receiver if he plays outside of his frame. So I like length. And then what do they look like when they run? I, sometimes times, the, the 40 times don't correlate with, with what you see on tape. And again, that's where it comes back to the tape. But the real numbers for me is just the length and then their weight. Um, I, think it's, uh, I think most of the guys I've coached that have had a lot of success uh, Mercedes might have been the biggest at 55, 
you know, 255 for me. So I like guys that are in, in a weight range that, uh, you know, I will allow them to run and, <laughs> and do some of the things that we're going to ask them to do. So what was it about George Kittle? Uh, at 6'4", 247 pounds. He runs an impressive 40 time at 4'5", when he was coming out of the University of Iowa. He only had about 300 yards receiving, I think, in his best year there. And then in 2018, he sets an NFL single-season single record in terms of receiving yards at the tight end position. So what was it about him that you saw coming out of college and what has ultimately made the difference to help him to become the player that he is today? Well, the first thing is I knew he loved football. And knowing that how he felt about the game of football, I knew that uh, we would be able to uh, coach him in a manner and use his skill set in a manner that would allow him to have an opportunity to to be a, a very good football player. Um, when you watched his tape, he played to the echo of the whistle. You know, I'm <laughs> I'm kind of old school about that, but it's he always was straining to finish. And then, like you said, he didn't have a lot of production in the pass game, but that was more of a product of the offense they played in. And... Um, to me, that said a lot about him because that also told me he was a team player. Because sometimes guys, yeah, they want to win, but only if they get to be the focal point. You know what I mean? And the fact that he knew, and I'm sure it wasn't just when he got here, but he always knew deep down that he could be a difference maker in the past game, but yet that wasn't being featured at Iowa. Yet when you watch the tape, every play he was playing like, you know, it was the last play of the game. And it depended on him doing his job for them to win. So seeing all those things and, and, and getting the feel for how he felt about football with the conversations that we had, uh, with I had with him during the combine and, and on the phone, I just – he was – he was a guy I had ranked very, very high uh, coming out and was just nervous about whether we're going to get him because I, I kept, you know, saying third round, like, God, let's go get him, let's go get him, let's go get him. And, you know, obviously a lot of people didn't have high grades on him. Uh, that was part of the process, the, draft, the decision makers with uh, throughout the league, and I'm glad that uh, we were able to still get him. Yeah, they made you wait until the fifth round. And speaking of high grades, here at PFF, George Kittle has been our highest graded tight end in the NFL over the last two seasons. Um, just kind of talk to me about that. And does that leave an impression on him? Because I know a lot of the players, they're asking you about their PFF grades. Yeah, yeah, you know, it is. It's uh, this what, what you guys have done. Um, I think is fantastic because, uh, you know, it's, when you and I played, we got grades, you know, a, a letter grade or you graded out at 82 percent or and it was so arbitrary, you know, depending on plays, your point of attack and all those different things. You guys have done a great job of coming up with formulas that breaks it down. Hey, here's where you are as a pass protector. Here you are as a run blocker. Here you are as a pass catcher or whatever it is based off a of position, how many pressures he's given up or sacks or drops and, and all those things. And I think that's awesome because, um, you know, in our room, you know, we, we, the, I grade them on finish. Are they between their man and the ball when the, when the ball carrier is tackled? In the run game and the pass game, do you make more than one man bring you down or make the first guy miss? You know, that's it's those things. If you didn't, it's a minus. If you did, it's a plus. But when you sit there and you talk to the guys about where they are graded and all that, like I know with Kittle – and with me a little bit, it's like, hey, this run game, I feel like is, you know, we got to keep getting that up because I know how he feels about his run blocking and, and wanting to be the best at that. You know, he just, he takes it with a grain of salt too from a standpoint too. It's a, 
opinion and you have to as a player because you don't want to listen to the crowd noise, so to speak. But I think it, when it's all said done at the end of the year, it's something that means a lot to them to be the best or, you know, great out at that. Now, he was recently um, uh, quoting you as someone who has really made an impact on him. Of course, you're his coach, but he said that you have taught him to not let one guy tackle you. Talk to me about that philosophy and, and how it has translated into production on the field. Well, you know, my philosophy is that once if we get the ball in this room, one guy should never be able to bring us down. You know, that's just, to me, it's a mentality that you have to have. Yes, it happens. We get that. But at the end of the day, you got to have the mentality, make them tackle you. You don't have to let them, make them. And so um, Georgia's rookie year, um, it is, for me, it starts in, in mini camp and OTAs. Like if you run out of bounds and, <laughs> you, you know, you're running down the field and the DBs are coming to tag off and you go out of bounds, that's a fine in the room. So it's just trying to create that mindset in them. And George's uh, rookie year preseason game against the Broncos, he caught a ball on a, on a slide route on a keeper and turned up the field. And he ran through two guys on the Broncos and went in for a touchdown. And he came to the sideline and he was like, you're right. You're right. I'm like, I'm telling you, you get going, you, you're going <laughs> to make some people pay. And so he's just, con he's consistently gained confidence over it. He's learned to get behind his pads, dip his shoulders and all that and, and run through tackles. And now it's become, uh, a makeup he, he's embraced it and it's become you know really a big part of what he is as a player oh there's no doubt he literally attacks defensive backs even though he's the one carrying the football you love the effort you love the energy you love the passion one last question before we let you go what do you say to those kids out there who are aspiring tight ends and they hear people saying hey tight ends don't go to the pro bowl as run blockers what do you say to that, John Embry? Well, there's a couple things I say to that. First off, my daughter can catch a football, so I ain't going <laughs> to catch a ball. All right, so if you think you're going to make a living just catching it, you're, you're sorely mistaken. Um, you know, I, I went a little bit through that with Mercedes uh, in college, and now Mercedes is in year 14. I think maybe the best, I'm going to say this, uh, between him and George, two best blocking tight ends in the NFL. And – um, he learned to block. I taught him how to block. I taught him the mindset. We drill some things. And to me, I would tell a kid, you're going to play longer in the NFL if you can block than you will as a pass catcher. Um, there's a few that get to, you know, in the right system and the right, everything has to fall right where you can have a long career not blocking. But if you can become a blocker, Logan Paulson was another kid I had at UCLA who's had a, very long career in the NFL. I think he made 11 and outlasted, I think, everyone in his draft class. He was undrafted um, because he can block. <laughs> so uh, if you want to have a long career in the NFL, uh, if you want to separate yourself from a guy who can just run and catch, learn to block because that is what is the difference as far as longevity. That's a way to separate yourself. And if you can't catch, that's the way you become a complete player. And then you can play every play instead of just playing 38 snaps a game or 40 snaps a game out of a 64 snap game. You know, if, if you love football, you don't want to come off the field. And the way to make sure you don't come off the field is to be good at everything that's required at your skill set. And, and for tight ends, for us, you, you better be able to run block. Yeah, the tight ends you have coached, uh, there's a long a list of names uh, that of guys you have coached. And, you know, I got to ask you one more question about Tony Gonzalez. A former, he's a Hall of Fame tight end. <laughs> and I know you coached him. You had some time with him in Kansas City. Give me one story about Tony uh, because he really does credit you with making an impact on his career. Well, Tony, we've had a lot of great moments together. I, I, I was fortunate to be with him when he set the career record in catches and career record in yards and, and touchdowns. I was with him for all those milestones and uh, being able to be a part of it was special. But Tony is, uh, 
a guy that is very prideful. He's a guy that works very hard. Um, he uh, prepares like no one else. It's it's really it was really an honor to uh, have Kosum. But he uh, he called me actually the other day. We still talk, and he was talking about <laughs> how uh, I let Kittle come out of the game. You know, George has had that broke. He has that broken bone in his leg and MCL issue. So uh, he saw he, he let me. I let Kittle come out. And he was sharing the story. We were playing in Miami, and it was really hot that day, and he was dying. He'd run a couple seam routes and all this stuff, and he kept looking to the sideline for, you know, to come out. And he kept having his helmet, and I kept waving him to go back in. And I like, I'm not, and I shake my head, I'm not letting him out. And he comes to the sideline, and he was mad at me, and we had some words and and not you know meaning it but he's like i need to come out of the game i'm like dude you don't get to come out of the game i said you're tony gonzalez tony gonzalez doesn't come out of football (laughs) games so (laughs) we uh we had a great relationship and uh but he was calling telling me i'm getting soft now because i let kiddo come out i said well if you had a broken ankle i'd let you come out for a player too (laughs) too well john hey we want to thank you for taking the time i always say that the really good coaches they can take an average player and make them good and they make good players great you deserve all the credit for the great work you've done improving the abilities and talents of some really good players. And, of course, they do give you the credit. We want to thank you for taking the time to join us today. All right. Appreciate it. You want to get rid of me and get back to more great PFF YouTube content? All you have to do is push that button right there and subscribe. Thanks for watching.